what is going on guys my name is Bucky Roberts and welcome to your very first tutorial in Adobe Photoshop now in this tutorial series what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start you guys from the very basics of Photoshop assuming that you guys have never even opened Photoshop before so I'm gonna be taking you from a very beginner just getting uh, you know showing you the interface the very basic tools to some very advanced Photoshop techniques. So these tutorial series are pretty much for everyone. So sit back, relax, grab a hot pocket, and crack your knuckles and enjoy. Now, if you're watching this video because you know you heard of Photoshop before, but you aren't really sure what it is, and you just wanted to see a quick example, let me go ahead and tell you guys what Photoshop is. Even though I know a bunch of you guys already probably know what it is, and that's a program that you use to edit photos and images digitally. Now, you can use it to edit photos that you took with a digital camera, or you can also, you know, create your own graphics. For example, if you want to make a logo for your company, you can also use Photoshop to create new graphics, images, cartoons as well. Now, it's probably most well known for, you know, altering photos for like models and stuff, making, uh, you know, fat people like myself look skinny, or you can also use it to make skinny people look fat if you want. That'd be kind of weird. But anyways, I also already assume that uh, I th I'm guessing you guys have it installed on your computer already. Um, it's really easy. Just pop in the desk, press next, next, next a thousand times. It's installed. I didn't want to do a tutorial of that because, you know, if you're using this program, you guys probably know how to install stuff. So install it, open it up. And the first thing I want to do before I just open a photo and start editing it and, you know, getting real involved is I want to go over the interface real quick because once you open Photoshop you see all these menus and buttons and tools on the left hand side and all these tabs and it's kind of overwhelming at first so in the first couple of tutorials I just want to show you guys how to navigate the interface or the layout and that's what I'm going to do in this tutorial so first of all let's go ahead and take a look at the right hand side and you see that the interface is made up of a bunch of different panels or I often call them tabs this swatches tab for example the color tab but technically they're called panels so I'll try to call them panels from here on out now Photoshop pretty much organizes a bunch of similar actions or a bunch of similar properties or settings in tabs for example the color tab is where you work with all your color um, you have different styles on the styles tab all your layers so they basically grouped a bunch of things together for you because there's like literally about 10 trillion and of course not literally but there's a ton of things in Photoshop and that's just how they organize things in panels or tabs so first of all, I want to teach you guys how to open and close panels. Now right now we see that there's a swatches, color, adjustment, styles, layers, channels, and paths panel open. Now Photoshop actually has a lot more panels than this and if you ever want to open one or if I'm talking about a panel and you guys don't see it, just go to this window menu and the one, the options with the checkbox are the panels that are open and for example this histogram history info see how they don't have a check next to it that means that the panel is not open so if you know I say open your color tab or color panel just go ahead and make sure it has a checkbox and you're good to go so after that I want to show you guys how to collapse and expand these so if you have a bunch of different panels open things can get cluttered really quick as you can see this looks pretty cluttered already and we didn't even open any new ones so in order to collapse these go ahead and double click the name of the panel and whenever you do that you see how it collapses now swatches and color panel is now collapsed so we can actually collapse them all if we just double click and double click and it cleans everything up so let's say we only wanted to work with you know maybe the swatches panel we just go ahead and click that once and it would expand again but anyways that's how you collapse and expand panels by double clicking the name of them pretty sweet huh now another thing I want to mention is that panels are in groups so right now this swatches and color panel there are two different panels but they're in the same group the same window kind of so 
what you can do is Adobe Photoshop gave you the ability to customize your groups. So say that you work with the swatches and color panels a lot, so you don't want to keep clicking from tab to tab, back and forth, it can get kind of annoying. You want to put those in different groups. So you can take the color panel and if you actually go ahead and drag it, you can drop it into a whole nother group. So you can either drop it right here to make its own group or if you want to put it in this uh, group right here with adjustments and styles you can go ahead and drag it and drop it in there so again you can make a panel its own group or group it with other panels as well again this is all personal preference whatever the heck you want to do that's up to you now if you want to get super crazy you can actually have this um, well, I guess we might as well work with the color panel. So you can actually drag this and drop it right in this gray area, and then it's going to turn into its own floating group. So this pretty much gives you the feel of, you know, like Microsoft Windows where the windows are floating around. But I usually like to have them in tabbed groups just like that. But you know, if you want to get crazy, have that little window feel, have it float around, go ahead. Now the last couple things I want to talk about because I know you guys are probably falling asleep from this freaking tutorial already, but uh, you know, we didn't, you know, turn any oranges in the robots or anything cool with images yet. But a couple more things about the interface is you can also collapse and expand entire panel sets. Now what's a panel set? Well the panel set is pretty much this column of panels right here. So if you are working on a big image and you want to hide this entire set, then go ahead and click this little double arrow right there and it's going to collapse this entire column, give you some more space to work on your image. Now again, there's actually two uh, sets right here in case you didn't notice. So let's go ahead and expand both of these sets, one right there and one right there. So again, through those things, you pretty much uh, know now how to do everything as far as customizing your panels, getting your layout exactly how you want it to. Now, the last thing I want to uh, talk about panels, and guys, I am I promise you guys, this is the last thing I'm going to say about panels, and then I'll go on to something a little bit more interesting in the next video. But you guys are like, okay, that's how you move panels around and, you know, expand them, collapse them, make them float like a window. But what if I just want to get rid of a panel completely? Well, what you can do, the easiest way is just this. Say you want to get rid of this styles panel because you're like, I don't even know what styles is. I never use it. I just want to get rid of it. What you can do is you can either right click it and hit close or every group has a little drop down menu right here and this is just a menu to give you more options for example this swatches one if you just go ahead and um, choose that little menu it's gonna give you more options about the swatches panel obviously like any menu would do in any program so now that you are experts on Photoshop panels <laughs> we can move on to some more interesting topics you know something more useful and exciting but for this tutorial I just want to say thank you guys for watching, and if you have any questions at all, then you can ask me on my Twitter, Google+, or on my forum, and I'll put a link below in the description, So, or you can, you know, just leave a YouTube comment, but whatever. So, thank you guys for watching, uh, don't forget to subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Roses are red, violets are blue, I have a gun, kit in the van. That's beautiful, I think I'm going to send that to my girlfriend. Oh, sorry guys, I didn't even notice that uh, I was recording right now. That's embarrassing. But anyways, welcome to your second Photoshop tutorial. And in this lesson, I want to start going over the tools in Photoshop. Different from a tool that you meet like at a bar or something because these tools aren't douchebags. So, <laughs> that's probably why, uh, you know, schools aren't allowed to watch my tutorials because I say things like douchebags. I'm trying to make a professional video here. But anyways you can see all the tools in Photoshop on the left hand side all these little buttons icons right here are Photoshop's tools now each tool does a different job much like tools in real life for example you have tools for selecting images or items the most common one is the move tool the one at the top that looks like an arrow in a uh, you know four different arrows I guess you also have tools like paint brushes where you can obviously paint something like lines whatever um, there's some tools for adding text the text tool right here a bunch of different tools to do different things 
that you commonly would have used to alter your image in some way. Now, before I go into detail of what each of these tools does, because that would take forever, there are actually over 70 tools in Photoshop, and every tool probably needs an individual tutorial to fully explain the capabilities of each. What I'm going to do in this video is I'm just going to show you around the basic overview of how to use and navigate your tools panel. So you see that there are about 20 tools visible right now but I said that Photoshop has over 70 so was I lying? Well no I wasn't. A bunch of tools are grouped under the same button and you can tell if a tool has more tools under the same button because some tools you see this move tool right here there's not an arrow on the bottom right hand corner but other tools like this they have these arrows on the bottom right hand corner if you look closely so in order to access the other tools that are grouped with this just go ahead and click that and you can see that once you do a sub menu pops up so this uh, tool actually has a rectangle elliptical single row and single column tool all under the same button. So why does Photoshop do this? Well, it just helps organize similar tools and, you know, just helps, you know, less clutter, I guess. So that's how you access similar tools. And a cool way that you can change from tool to tool if you're really lazy is you can use, obviously, to select the tool, you can click it and then you're working with that tool. But each tool also has a hotkey as well. Now, what is a hotkey? Well, if you hover over the tool, it tells you the tool name. For example, this is the move tool. This is the single column magnetic lasso tool. So say that we're working with this spot healing brush tool and we want to switch to the magnetic lasso tool, but we are way la lazy. We're eating, you know, a big burrito with our right hand. So what we can do is we can see that it says magnetic lasso L in the parentheses. So we can just go ahead and hit L on our keyboard and now we're automatically um, working with the magnetic lasso tool. So to select a tool you can either click it with your mouse or use the hotkey and how do you figure out the hotkey? If you hover over it it's in parentheses. So move tool is V. You want to remember that one because this is a common one. Now aside from you know selecting tools and seeing all the sub tools tools also have options. So what do I mean by that? Probably the easiest uh, one I can explain right now is the paintbrush tool. Now the paintbrush tool is of course the one that looks like a paintbrush right here right under your spot healing brush and it's hotkey B so whenever you click it you can see that these buttons at the top change. Now these options are going to change depending on which tool you select. For your brush tool you select things like size of the brush, how big do you want your brush to be, the shape of your brush, do you want it to be skinny or big and thick. Now all of the settings are right here. For example, the opacity is pretty much how much you can see through. So each of these options pretty much you can select in different ways. Some have drop down menus, some have sliders like this. So if I only wanted it 50% opacity, change that to 50%, now it would be lighter. And you can also change this by using another shortcut slider where a lot of people don't know about this. But if you hover over the name opacity, you can see that your icon or your cursor rather, it changes to a little finger with two arrows on each side. Just go ahead and click and drag left and right. And again, <laughs> I don't know why Photoshop did this because, you know, whoever's too lazy, like, okay, I want to change the opacity, but I'm not clicking this and then sliding it. I'm just going to, you know, I just want to click one thing and then drag. You know, I guess you can do it this way, but I like using the slider, you know, in case anyone wants to know. So, you know, all of these tools have different shapes and uh, different options. And again, if you're uh, working with the tool and then you see a different list of options, that probably means that you have the wrong tool selected. So that's all I wanted to mention on tools. And before I let you guys go, I guess I have time to show you guys how to do one more thing. Actually, you know what? That's really for another tutorial because it's a whole separate subject because now that you know how to work with tools and know all about panels, I think it's time to you say, you know what, it's time to create our own new document. So in the next tutorial, we're going to be showing you, or I'm going to be showing you how to create a new document. It's going to be awesome. It's probably going to be the best video that you guys ever saw on YouTube. So thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you guys in the next video.
Alright guys, welcome to your third Photoshop tutorial and in this tutorial I'm going to show you guys how to create a new document. Now this is a little bit more difficult than creating like a new document in Microsoft Word because you just don't press file, new, and then you're good to go. There are actually a lot of settings that you need to go through before you create a document and I'm going to be talking you guys through all of those settings right now. So go ahead and choose file, new and like I said unlike any other program where everything just pops up and it's ready to go you have to answer a bunch of questions or fill out a form before you can you know make a new document so the first one name it's easy I'll just name this you know YouTube name it whatever pretty much the name of your file so whenever you save it this is going to be the default name that it saves under now right here your next option is your preset now this is generally uh, the main option you want to focus on first because you need to ask yourself first what are you using this for if you're just gonna make a graphic for the web or you know just something that you're gonna stick on a blog or something then just go ahead and put it at default Photoshop size and it's gonna fill out the rest of these settings for you however if you're making like a flyer for I don't know maybe you're gonna make a have a garage sale or something then you usually want to choose US paper or maybe you're working on something for a movie then you can choose film and video and then it's going to give you some more options of your video but just for the probably the rest of these tutorials and just for default you usually want to stick with default Photoshop size and then everything is filled up basically how you want it to so the next setting unless you're doing anything weird then just go ahead and stick with that the next setting is the width and height now usually whenever you're working with the web then you want to work in pixels but some people prefer inches again if you're overseas then you probably don't use inches and use metric instead but I prefer to work in pixels just cuz you know I design things for websites a lot and whenever I talk in Photoshop I don't I'm not like okay move this make a box that's two inches wide people usually say make a box that's you know 150 pixels wide so that's why I prefer to work in pixels as well but you can work in whatever matter of preference now resolution is where things get kinda of tricky because it really depends on and really all of these things right here depend on what is your final image gonna be used for if you're making an image that you want to use on a website or the web in general or, or on your computer at all it needs to be 72 pixels per inch again it doesn't need to be but that's the best resolution to use um, for the web or for a computer if you're printing for example if you want to make a flyer for you know your garage sale or you know um, your new business and hang it up at the grocery store then what you want to do is you want to change this to 300 pixels per inch so it really depends on your printer but typically printers are 300 pixels per inch that's going to give you the best quality and for the web as you see if you ever choose default it puts it at 72 because that's the best for images that you just view on the computer now if you use anything less than 72 or less than 300 for printing it's gonna make the image look kinda of pixelated and bad quality and if you're saying you know what I want this image to be really good for the web so I'm gonna put this at you know 1000 pixels per inch that's gonna look crisp actually it's not gonna look crisp it's gonna look worse and the reason that you know they put 72 is because that's the standard so don't think that um, you know putting like a thousand pixels per inch is gonna give you a really high quality image it's not gonna make a difference it's just gonna use it's just gonna waste a bunch of memory on your computer so remember the rule 72 for web 300 for print now the color mode is another weird thing you know how you know when Apple and Microsoft were first making their computers they couldn't make anything compatible this is another weird thing that the compute the people who made like printers and computers this add this to annoy us RGB and CMYK are the two main color modes you're gonna use whenever you're working with images on the computer use RGB and typically printers prefer CMYK so if you ever want to print something on a piece of paper it's probably better to use CMYK color but since I'm making tutorials and using these pictures on the web you typically want to stick with RGB 90% of the time 
Now the other color modes, I might as well go over those, is grayscale pretty much means, um, you know, if you're making a black and white photo, you want it all grayscale. And the rest of these, lab color and bitmap. Lab stands for luminosity A and B channels and bitmap. Don't even worry about lab and bitmap right now because that's more advanced stuff. The really only thing you need to worry about in these tutorials, I'm going to be using RGB 100% of the time and that's what people typically use unless you're doing something really weird. So just remember that, that's the main one. We'll talk about the more advanced ones in the upcoming tutorials. Now 8-bit, don't really worry about that right now. 8-bit's fine for what we're going to be doing. The background contents are, you can make it a color, which is, you know, of course green, blue. I typically like to use white because, first of all, even if you want your background transparent, like you're making a logo that you're going to put on a website and you don't want a background that's white, I like to um, make the logo with a white background anyways because it's easier to work with and then later on when you're when you want to save the final image you can take the white away so I always choose white right here and even if you want the background to be transparent you don't want to work with a transparent background it looks weird in Photoshop so you wanna pretty much always stick with white right here and I'll show you how you can remove the background really easy later on about two clicks of the button now the other things I want to go over is the advanced section again this is obviously advanced stuff so you might as well just hide that because you don't want to accidentally click anything but the color profile don't even worry about that right now um, whenever we talk about color management I'll talk about that in the pixel x aspect ratio this is pretty much do you want your pixels to be square or not square pretty much 99.9% .9 of the time you want square pixels the only people who ever don't want square pixels is if you're working with a really um, weird video editing program some video things or some graphics that you make for videos like titles or I don't know maybe you're just making a special effect on your video they like pixels that are kind of stretched out because you know how every like TV screen in every video monitor displays your image a little bit differently but unless you really know what you're working with with video again 99% just leave this at square pixels I never used uh, anything but square pixels so once you're done setting everything then just go ahead and hit OK and it creates a new blank document where you can draw on, add some text, add some images, add whatever you want. So that's how you create a new document. Again, file, new, and then fill out everything you need to. And in the next tour, what I'm going to do is, well, you know what? I'm not going to tell you guys because it's going to be awesome. Don't want to spoil it for you. But again, a lot of these things you don't even want to touch. You just want to choose default Photoshop size and OK. But if you want to go, you know, change one thing specific to how you want it, that's how you do it. So thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to subscribe, follow me on Twitter, Google+, and, you know, if you want to send me like $1,000 in the mail, you can do that too. So uh, thanks for watching again, and I'll see you in the next video. All right, guys, welcome to your fourth tutorial. And now that we know how to make a blank document, the next thing I want to show you guys is how to open an existing image. Because... The reason that you would make a blank document first is because if you wanted to create a cartoon or a graphic or a logo, then you would start from scratch. But a lot of the time you just take pictures with, I don't know, your phone or get a picture from a website or your digital camera and you just want to edit it in Photoshop somehow. So in that case, you wouldn't create anything from scratch since you already have the image on your computer. So if you want to open up that image, this is how you do that instead of file new you go to file open and then look on your computer and navigate to that image so under Photoshop images I have a beautiful photo already that my mom took when I was like I don't know I probably look three or four years old here's me with the freaking sweet shorts right there and I am feeding a deer I'm probably feeding him I don't know I, he probably just got done ate, eating a hot pocket or something and actually a few seconds later he bit my entire arm off fun fact I'm just kidding here he didn't do that but look in his eye see that he wanted to he wanted to so anyways here's me feeding a deer and you know what I'm getting sidetracked the important concept is that's how you open an existing image file open so that's how you do that but say that I like this image 
and I wanted to give it to my mom for her 89th birthday, but she doesn't like deer at all. She happens to love chickens. So what I want to do is I want to take another image that I have of a chicken that's on my computer and I want to place it over this deer right here. So you may be thinking, you know what, I know how to do that. File, open, desktop, where's the chicken image? Right here, chicken, and oh crap, it opened as a new document. I don't want to do that. I want it over here on this one. Okay, um, what do I do? Do I drag and drop this over? You know what? A lot of beginners often do this whenever they want to take an existing image and insert it into a document that they already have open. So unlike before we went, where we went file and open again, what you need to do whenever you want to take an existing image and put it inside the document is hit file place. What this does is it allows you to select an image such as this chicken image and whenever you hit place it places it inside an existing document. So now what I can do is I can go ahead and with my little arrow move this around exactly how I want it to and you can also if you can see on the corner of this little frame that's surrounding the chicken are little um, squares I guess. Now with these squares you can go ahead and resize your chicken so let me just resize this perfectly so instead of the deer I'm now feeding the chicken just like that and once you got everything moved around and resized using your little squares and uh, cursor oh I got freaking phlegm in my throat just go ahead and hit enter and what this does is it pretty much sets it in the given position it's called rasterizing it but it pretty much um, sets it as the final image or position so that is basically wow you know what once we step back and look at this we can see that this is a beautiful looking picture when I was two years old I fed this chicken and you know people would believe it this looks completely realistic right here but anyways if you want to open a new image that you just took with your camcorder or something go to file open and that allows you to do that it creates a new document where your image is or if you want to take an existing image and place it inside a new document you go to file place and it places an existing image inside the document that you're working on so there is that tutorial I hope you guys understand and if anyone wants this beautiful photo then uh, I'll have it for sale on eBay probably for like 10 cents because it's pretty crappy but anyways thank you guys for watching don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you guys in the next video oh yeah follow me on Twitter what is going on guys welcome to your fifth Photoshop tutorial and in this lesson I'm gonna teach you guys how to change the images size so we have this image right here of me feeding a deer just go ahead and open up any image doesn't really matter and this photo is pretty big right now it it's almost taking up my entire computer screen and if I wanted to post this image on a website or I don't know maybe Google Plus or something where it's generally better to have images that are a little bit smaller what I want to do is I want to change the overall size of this image so in order to change the size we need to edit the image size properties so in order to access that go ahead and select image image size now what this allows you to do is change the images size now if you don't have all these options available then what you need to do is you need to make sure that resample image checkbox is checked this pretty much allows you to change the size of the image that's all it means resize image now another thing that you probably want to do is you want to make sure that you have constraint proportions checked and this just helps you because whenever you um decrease the size as I'm about to do it keeps it proportional because if you just change the width or only change the height then your image would be dis distorted or skewed so it's better to have this constrain proportions checkbox checked checkbox checked uh, kind of a tongue twister there so say we wanted the width to be 600 instead of over a thousand so go ahead and type in 600 right here and whenever you do that notice that the height automatically changes as well why does it do that because that's the height it needs it calculates all this automatically to make it proportional to the original image so that's really all you need to do um, the only other thing is 
you have these options right here at the bottom on this drop down list. It says like nearest neighbor, bilinear, bicubic. What you generally want to choose is bicubic automatic. This I won't get into all this uh, right now. Some are best for different types of uh, images, but bicubic automatic is the best for all around high quality results whenever you're resizing images. So just go ahead and make sure you have that selected. And once you get your sizes resized, hit OK and check it out. Our image is now smaller, still awesome, amazing quality. Pretty freaking cool, huh? So that is how you resize an image but what if you want to resize the canvas now <coughs> oh excuse me so say that you wanted to make a border around this image what you need to do then is you need to resize the working area or the canvas of this document so in order to do that just go to image and then you go to canvas size and then this is where you resize the canvas so enter a new canvas size in of course since we're working in pixels let's go ahead and change this to pixels and the original canvas is just the original size of the image which is 600 by 454 now let's say we want to I don't know put a border of 100 pixels around each one so this is going to be 800 and this is going to be 654 now what this relative checkbox means is if you click it relative pretty much means how much more so instead of saying okay what do you want the size of the new canvas to be you can hit relative and this means 200 more for the width and 200 more for the height but I always like to leave that unchecked because I don't know it's just personal preference now what confuses a lot of people is this anchor right here generally probably I don't know 90% of the time you want to keep your anchor in the middle right there and the ankle anchor is this circle little uh, button icon whatever you want to call it but what anchor means is where do you want to anchor your original image because whenever you make a canvas it makes pretty much a border around the image so if we anchor this in the top middle or it'll probably be better if I anchor in the top left then what this means is it's gonna draw the canvas on the right hand side the bottom it's pretty much going to draw the canvas on the right and the bottom. Well, yeah, I just said that. So the only other thing that we need to do is we need to put a canvas extension color. It's a pretty big name for what color do you want the canvas to be. So if you double click this, you can go ahead and choose a color. I'll make mine, I don't know, red or something. Looks pretty good. Hit OK. So what we pretty much said is the current size of this image is 600 by 454 we want to change the canvas size we're not stretching or shrinking the image at all what we're just doing is changing the canvas size to 800 by 654 so we have more space to work with but the image isn't going to change now the canvas size or excuse me the canvas color is going to be red and it's going to be and the image is going to be anchored in the top left now remember this right here because whenever I click OK this gives you a better idea of what that anchor means. You can see that the anchor or the original image as they should have called it is in the top left and the canvas is now on the right hand side and on the bottom. So again that's why I said that most of the time it's better to um, put your anchor in the middle because that gives you a nice even canvas all around your picture but just for demonstration purposes I think that more clearly demonstrates what an anchor is used for but generally put it in the middle but anyways that's the uh, pretty much basics of this tutorial thank you guys for watching don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you guys in the next video what is going on guys welcome to your sixth Photoshop tutorial and in this lesson it's gonna be awesome I got a ton of stuff to cover gonna be jam-packing your guys brains full of valuable information on and uh, well let's go ahead and get started so the first thing I want to talk about is saving your image or saving your document. Now, of course, you guys probably already know how to save it. File, um, for the first time you want to do save as, and once you have it saved, you can just press save. But to save um, a Photoshop file, what you want to do is you want to first of all navigate to where you want to save it, and you want to make sure the format is P. SD. Now this is a Photoshop format specific to this program and the reason that you always want to save a Photoshop 
specific file is because it includes all the information like different layers, um, different channels, paths, and you guys will understand what all this means whenever we talk about them, but this is the best format whenever you're working in Photoshop. Now, we'll go ahead and save one called Apples, or what's this, a guy's face. Save it as a Photoshop. So now we have a Photoshop file that we can edit all the layers, um, you know, do all the cool things that are built in Photoshop. However, whenever you're ready to post the image to Facebook or a website or to print it out, well, it doesn't really matter if you print it out, but to post it on the web, you can't just post a Photoshop file on the web. Google Chrome and Internet Explorer and Firefox, they're not going to understand what a Photoshop file is supposed to look like. So in order to do that, you need to export it as a JPEG or a PNG or a GIF. Now, in order to save this image as a final JPEG or GIF or, you know, PNG or anything, go to File, Save As, and instead of Photoshop format, change this to something like a uh, ping so then you can go ahead and save this and it says okay it usually gives you settings at the end and just press okay so that ping file is now something that you can use for you know your websites your blog Twitter whatever you want so aside from that I want to talk to you guys about two more things the first thing is how to find updates and patches in Photoshop now just so I clear things up I want to tell you guys that updates and patches aren't the same thing. This is just, you know, side information, but an update, whenever you hear about an Adobe updating a product, it means that it added new features such as, I don't know, maybe another tool or maybe you have um, more options in a drop down list or something. That's what an update is. A patch, on the other hand, is a bug fix. If there's maybe a memory leak in the program or it freezes whenever you click a certain button, that's what a patch is going to fix. So patches are more important, but updates are pretty freaking cool too. Now the cool thing is, unlike you know Call of Duty map packs, all of the updates are 100% free. So in order to check for updates, go to Help, Updates, and then it's going to give you this little thing. It says Checking for Updates and okay so evidently I have a lot of stuff to update and I'll do that later because you know um you know I don't wanna waste your time just showing me downloading and updating stuff but whenever you wanna update it just go ahead and click that I'll probably do it after this tutorial and the cool thing about it is you click that button and it downloads all the updates for you and it installs everything automatically incredibly easy almost as easy as well I won't even get it in that but uh the last thing I want to talk to you guys about is how to deactivate Photoshop. Now, in case you didn't know, Photoshop only allows you to install its program on two different computers. They say like your main computer, your desktop, and your laptop. And that's just so people can't pirate the software and buy one copy and give it out to, you know, 600 friends. So what if you already installed Photoshop on two computers, but then um, I don't know, one of your computers is starting to mess up, so you bought another one. Well, do you have to go buy Photoshop again and install it on that computer? No. Actually, you can deactivate one of these copies, so you install it on a new computer instead. So in order to, I don't know, let's say that this computer I'm working on right now is starting to mess up and I want to move this Photoshop over to another one. We have to deactivate this one first by going to Help deactivate and once you're in here it's gonna say okay do you want to deactivate it and then you press that and that's how you do that so you know this was a tutorial not really on let me just do you want to quit yes not really on you know how to edit images but it's really important information that you need to know if you want to become an expert Photoshop user. So in the next tutorial, we're going to be jumping back into editing images, learning how to do some cool stuff. But for now, thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. And by the way, I got a bloodhound puppy today. So um, if you guys want to check out my vlog, you'll see it there. It's freaking adorable. So anyway, thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you guys later. What the fudge is going on ladies? Welcome to your seventh Photoshop tutorial and in this lesson I have to talk about the navigator panel and I got to teach you guys about screen modes and I'm going to be going over the zoom tool whole bunch of crap that I'm going to be teaching you guys so let's go ahead and start with the navigator panel now by default the navigator panel is not 
um, visible. So go ahead to your window and make sure that the navigator panel has a check next to it. If it doesn't, then go ahead and click it. And now you see that your navigator panel opens up on the left hand side. So just go ahead and make this a little bit bigger, not too big. That's what she said. And that looks pretty good right there. So what the navigator panel is, is it's basically an easy way to navigate around your image or document. Now the pretty much most simple thing that you can do with it is just zoom in and out of your image. So here's my main image right now. This is actually a picture of my sister. Uh, I don't know what she's doing, just probably, you know, being a model in training. So to zoom in, what you need to do is hold this slider right here on your navigator panel and zoom in just like this. Now, as you can see, a red box appears whenever you zoom in far enough. Now the red box basically represents the visible area of your image. So as you can see, it's you know close to her hand and her bottom lip. So that is the visible area in your main document. Now of course, if you want to zoom out, you can either use the slider or you can use these two little mountain icons next to it. Small mountain, of course, zooms out. Large mountain zooms in in increments. Now the last thing that you could do or the last technique that you can use is you can actually enter a value. So you know how we're zoomed in to 81%. Well, if we want to go ahead and zoom out to, I don't know, 25%, just go ahead and type in 25, hit enter, and then your image is going to be zoomed out 25%. By the way, the default is 100 right there. So aside from that, as you can see, Earlier I talked about this little red box. Now red is a pretty cool color and you know this little red box is contrast to a lot of typical pictures but what if you're working with I don't know a photo that's in the morning where there are a lot of reds or maybe you're just working with a graphic and there's a lot of red colors in that. Well then this red box can get kind of confusing and you may want to change it to a different color. So to change this red box to a different color what you need to do is you need to use the option menu right here and choose panel options. This gives you your navigator's options and the only option is what color do you want to change the box to. So let's go ahead and change this to I don't know like a orange or something looks pretty good and uh, there you go now your box is orange so if you want to change the color that's how you do that now the next thing I want to talk about is screen modes now a lot of people just like to stick with this default screen mode but there are often times where other screen modes are definitely super beneficial so the default screen mode and of course to access your screen mode it's this button right here the default screen mode is standard screen mode and that's a screen mode with all your panels um, the bar at the bottom pretty much all this gray space around it now if you want to go to a different one then choose full screen mode with menu bar now as you can see whenever I did that everything kind of changed and the first thing you can notice is the little windows bar that was on the bottom that had the little uh, windows icon and the time and the toolbar it disappeared also there are no tabs on the top giving you the name of the document now the last screen mode is full screen mode and whenever you select this it gives you a little prompt that says okay you're about to go into full freaking screen mode it's kind of a big deal and it the reason that they give you this prompt is because whenever you click full screen there are no buttons so if you're clicking around like oh uh, how do I get out how do I get out you get out by pressing escape or F and then it puts you back into standard but those are the different screen modes and one thing I want to point out is that of course in standard mode you can do things like paint the picture in full screen mode you also have full access to all of your tools so even though you can't see your tools on the left hand side you can go ahead and I don't know maybe draw her a pair of glasses or uh, you know just give her some nail polish you also have full access to your tools even though you can't see them a lot of people don't know that now the last thing I want to talk about now that we covered screen mode in the navigator panel is the zoom tool now this zoom tool is the magnifying glass right here and it's the first tool that I want to go over because it's extremely important now even though it's only one tool there are multiple ways that you can zoom in 
and around your image. The first thing you can do is you can click a certain spot. So say I wanted to zoom into her eye. I'm just going to go ahead and hold the tool over her eye, click, 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 it zooms into her eye. So then, you know, maybe I could uh, make some better glasses or change the color of her eye, her eye whatever I want to do. Now another thing that's kind of useful is you can also hold this in. Now instead of clicking, just click once and hold it in. And as you can see, it zooms slowly into wherever you're holding. Now the last thing that you can do, aside from clicking and holding it in, is you can drag. So whenever you click this and drag right, it zooms in. And whenever you drag left, it zooms out. So remember, click, hold it in, or drag right and left. Those are the three different ways you can zoom. And another thing I want to show you guys real quick is say you're zooming around and you know you got all confused. If you just double click this little magnifying glass, then it puts you back to 100% default value. So there you go. There is how to use the navigation panel, how to change screen modes, and also how to use the zoom tool. Again, even though it's one little tool, it's pretty powerful once you get to know it. And you're definitely going to be using this a lot. It's probably your second most common tool. So uh, there you go. Thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you guys in the next video. Oh, hello there, everybody. Welcome to your eighth tutorial. And in this tutorial, I want to get started by talking to you guys about the hand tool. Now, we already covered the magnifying glass tool. And the hand tool is actually right above it, this little icon. But before we get to that, let's go ahead and open the document. It doesn't really matter what image you choose. And go ahead and zoom in so it takes up most of the screen. Now, the reason I want to do this is because it's easier to demonstrate the hand tool, shortcut H, on your keyboard if you have an image that's huge and zoomed in. So go ahead and select your hand tool, and it's very easy to work with. The purpose of the hand tool is to let you move around the document. Now, there are a couple ways you can move around the document. Whenever you zoom in far enough, you get scroll bars on the right hand side and on the bottom right here that helps you move around the document. But the hand tool allows you to do this much easier. Just go ahead and click on the document or the picture and drag it. So as you can see, just by moving your mouse, it's a whole lot easier than, you know, maybe you wanted to paint this eye a different color than going, okay, click this click this and okay click this you can just go ahead grab that hand tool bam look at that now the hand tool also has a sub tool with this button and it's called the rotate view tool so in order to use this pretty much just click on the image and whenever you do you see a compass appear all this does is pretty much rotates your image now of course the red part on the compass whenever you're moving it that points to whatever original part was up well, you guys can probably see it's pretty much represents north on your image now aside from just doing this manually We can also do is say you want to rotate this image 90 degrees exactly you can go up to the top right here Type in 90 and it pops right to 90 like that So once you're done moving everything around and you have the rotation tool selected Just go ahead and press reset view or you can just go ahead and enter zero and it's going to reset your view now, of course, to get this back zoomed in 100%, just double click your magnifying glass and bam, you're good to go. So that's pretty much uh, all there is to using the hand tool. Another thing actually I want to demonstrate, I should have demonstrated this earlier, but let's go ahead and zoom back in again. Another cool thing you can do when using um, the hand tool is, or I, I should probably rather say this, whenever you're using another tool, and I know that I only talked to you guys about um, the zoom tool in the hand tool right now but if you're ever using like a paintbrush or something to you know yada yada maybe I'm gonna put um, my name right here B U C K Y if you're ever using another tool and you want to switch to the hand tool real quick and you're too lazy to go all the way down here and click the hand tool or press H on your keyboard you can go ahead and hold in the space bar on your keyboard so check this out painting with the paintbrush holding in space bam switch to the hand tool now as long as you have space held in on your keyboard you can go ahead and use this hand tool maybe I want to paint his nose blue really space on my keyboard bam switch backs it switches back to the last tool that you used so remember those few things the hand tool is H 
is a lot easier than using the you know scroll bars on the right hand side and on the bottom the rotate tool is cool whenever you want to rotate it and you can also enter the value manually at the top and whenever you want to switch to the hand tool real quick from another tool just go ahead and hold on the space bar you got your hand tool you can move around release it and you get your tool back super easy super quick super efficient so in the next tutorial I'm gonna teach you guys how to work with multiple documents and I'm gonna be showing you guys lots of cool tricks so thank you guys for watching and uh, don't forget to subscribe follow me on Twitter and I'll see you in the next video ladies and gentlemen boys and girls welcome to your ninth video I cannot believe you guys are still watching these tutorials congratulations and here's a fun fact I actually recorded this tutorial about five minutes ago but then I went to edit it and I noticed that the mute was on my microphone so I recorded the whole video and I had no audio freaking ridiculous but anyways in this video what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you guys some really cool tricks when working with multiple documents so we already know how to work with one document right here but say we want to work with more than one document so let me just go ahead and open up another one uh, Statue of Liberty and if I open a uh, picture of my sister it doesn't really matter which documents you open now of course just like panels on the right hand side anytime you want to switch between documents just go ahead and click on the different tabs easy enough but clicking takes a lot of work and burns a lot of calories and we want to put those calories towards something more useful like watching TV so in order to do this the lazy way go ahead and hold down control on your keyboard and hit the tab button and once you hit the tab as you can see it cycles between your documents without ever having to touch the mouse super lazy and that is super awesome because lazy equals awesome now say that you don't just want to see one document at a time but you want to work with multiple or in other words you want to view more than one picture at a time whenever you're working so in order to do that we need to change the layout of our interface now anytime you want to change the layout go to window arrange and if you look closely at these options you can see the icons give you a little preview of what to expect so for example this three um, up horizontal is gonna stack each of your documents horizontally pretty cool now my favorite one whenever working with three is three up stacked that kinda sounds like an insult boy you just got three up stacked uh, uh, then you uppercut them in the face so if you click that you get one on the left and by the way this is a, a puppy I'm getting it's six weeks old and I have to wait till it's eight weeks to uh, pick it up but this is gonna be my new freaking bloodhound puppy love it already but uh, anyways one image on the left and then two on the right hand side and of course the default is called consolidate all to tabs doesn't really sound like an insult boy you just got consolidated all to tabs like what and they'll probably drop kick you if you said that but anyways that is how you rearrange your layout and another cool way that you can rearrange uh, your documents is just to switch the order of the tabs now you probably want to switch the order of the tabs maybe you took five pictures of someone hopping over a box in chronological order so you don't want to have them like one three five two four you want them one two three four five so in order to change um, the order of your tabs just go ahead and drag them and drop them left or right so now Haas is first if I wanted this last I just go ahead and put it last there you go now the last thing I want to show you guys how to do is how to make a tab a floating window so say that I wanted this puppy to be its own separate window kind of like we did with the panels just go ahead and hold on to the tab drag it drag it out into this gray area and drop it now whenever we drop it as you can see it's its own floating window just like uh, Microsoft Windows and by the way if you guys ever saw um, Microsoft Windows 8 it does not look that great to me but anyways we'll see how it goes so the reason that you may want to make one a floating tab and I actually do this a lot whenever I'm working with um, multiple documents that I want to combine together is you can make one a floating tab and drag it onto another document and check it out now we get two layers or two images in the same document but already I'm getting ahead of myself I shouldn't even be talking to you guys about layers yet that's a tutorial for another day so just forget I ever said that so for now I just want to say thank you 
Don't forget to uh, follow me on Google+, Plus. add me in the cool people circle, and uh, once you do, you're ready to move on to the next video, so hopefully my sound was working in this video, and I'll see you guys in the next tutorial. Alrighty guys, welcome to your 10th video, and in this video, I'm going to demonstrate to you guys how to use the ruler tool. Now, I opened up a picture already of me when I was, I don't know, I look like I'm about 4 years old or something. And uh, I can't remember exactly what happened this day, but it looks like I drank one too many juice boxes and I was probably just recovering from a hangover or something. But anyways, the ruler tool is under a sub, it's usually the eyedropper tool, but if you click it and hold it, you're going to select the ruler tool. And as you can see, your cursor changes to a little ruler with a plus sign and a little arrow on it. So the most simple thing that you can do with the ruler tool is just to drag the ruler tool or drag your cursor around and what it does is it measures the screen for you whatever you're measuring so if I wanted to measure the distance of my body I can see that from point A to where I started dragging to where I finished dragging the width at the very top is 832 and the height is negative 202 pixels now negative just means that you're going up and positive going down so it's basically 202 pixels change in height now whenever you release that you can see that the line stays there now it stays there for a couple reasons and we're going to be getting to that shortly how we can change the line around even but another thing I want to mention before I forget is also if you drag and hold down the shift key on your keyboard your ruler is going to snap to a perfect 45 degree angle no matter if your cursor is off by a little bit so that's 45 that's zero degrees and you could also you know go 180 360 well I guess 360 would be in the same spot but just remember that whenever you hold down the shift key it snaps to 45 degree angles now another thing I want to mention is say that you made a measurement like this and you're like you know what I want to measure the distance from this line to this red line so what you can do is actually you can change the starting point and the ending point of your ruler if you go ahead and hover over one of these points you can move it around by dragging it and dropping it same thing with the ending point just go ahead and drop that into place and aside from just moving the beginning point and the ending point you can actually move this entire line see by default your cursor has an arrow a ruler and a little plus sign and once you hover over your line that plus sign is going to disappear that's your indicator that you are hovered over the line so if you just drag this and move it you can go ahead and readjust that exactly where you want it. Now another cool thing that you can do is you can actually clear this line altogether and by clearing it I mean get rid of this line because if you say okay I'm just gonna click away oh crap it's not getting rid of it maybe I'll just do another one okay got rid of this one but now I have this line what the heck in order to get rid of this line completely just go ahead and hit this clear button on the top and bam your line's gone now the last thing I want to tell you guys is a cool little trick and it's how to straighten the layer once you have a ruler measurement set. So say that for some reason you wanted to straighten this layer so that these lines on the bed instead of going you know to like a 45 degree angle that they were horizontal left and right according to the document. Well what you could do is you could draw a line there's actually several ways to do this this is probably the most the probably the hardest way but what you could do is you could actually draw a line along this bed and go up to here and press straighten layer now what that would do is take this line that's at uh, I don't know like a 31 degree angle right now and whenever it straightens you can see your image straightens along that line so now it looks like I'm about to slide off the bed and my head's probably gonna hit you know a toy or something down here but nonetheless uh, that's your introduction on how to use the basic ruler tool and in the next tutorial what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you guys how to use something called the ruler guides it's going to be thrilling so I'll see you guys next time what is going on guys welcome to your 11th Photoshop tutorial and in this video I'm gonna be teaching you guys about the ruler guides pretty sweet because you know last tutorial we learned about the ruler now that we're expert with that it's time to move on to something a little more interesting so what is a ruler guide a ruler guide is basically a checkpoint or it's pretty much a guide that allows you to visualize exactly where a certain location is so in order to better uh, demonstrate this the first thing we need to do is we need to view our 
rulers. So go ahead up to view and make sure that you have a checkbox next to rulers. What this is going to do is it's going to give you a ruler on the very top and on the left hand side of your working area and if you aren't in pixels right now just go ahead and right click the ruler and change it from inches or whatever you're on to pixels I just like working with pixels because I don't know I think they're pretty cool so how do we get a ruler guide well it's simple we just go up to the ruler and with our mouse left click and drag a ruler guide out to wherever we want it so say that I'm just measuring I don't know the area of my face go ahead and release and whenever we do that we create a ruler guide that's this little neon blue fluorescent line looking thing this is pretty much a guide that says hey you wanted a line at 47 pixels this is it so now if we wanted a line right here around like 330 pixels just go ahead and grab another one drag it down release and the cool little thing is a blob tells you exactly where you're gonna drop it release and there you go now you can also do this with the vertical one. Again, hover over the uh, little ruler here, click, drag, and release. So now we got the distance for my face exactly where we want it to be. Now this is useful, like I said, whenever you want to find out a specific distance, and it's really helpful whenever you're making logos. Not that useful whenever you just have a picture of Bucky as a baby screaming, but you know, for demonstration purposes, this will do just fine. Now another thing I want to teach you guys is what happens whenever you want to move these ruler guides. So say that, okay, my face on this left hand side is, you know, where I want it to be, but I actually want this left a couple picture pixels because I don't want to cut off my ear well what you can do is you can select the move tool or just press V on your keyboard and hover over the ruler guide now you know that you're gonna hover over it because once you do your cursor is gonna change from an arrow to a double-sided arrow now just go ahead and drag to wherever you want it to be and this is basically adjusting your previous ruler guide so we can go ahead and adjust all these if we want more of my face in the guide and once we have our guide set what you generally want to do is you want to lock your guides into place why is that it's because your move tool the one we have right now is one of the most commonly used tools so for sitting moving stuff around okay we don't accidentally want to bump one of these guides so in order to lock your guides into place go to view lock guides and bam now as you can see we no longer can adjust our guides pretty sweet however once you're done in order to get rid of your guides this is how you clear all of your guides because you know these lines are useful but you don't want them there all the time just go to view clear guides and it gets rid of all your guides now the last thing I want to talk about is this say that you have uh, I'm just gonna make two ruler guides real quick a ruler guide right here and right here now they call them ruler guides because whenever you're using your ruler tool it helps you guide your ruler tool so your ruler tool of course makes lines and whenever you select a line starting point here you can come up here and as you can see it doesn't just you know hover over it, it actually snaps to your guide if you look really closely snaps right there so now you can go ahead and move left and right and your line is gonna guide be guided along right here now this is useful whenever you wanna you know just move the end of your ruler to a certain place because if you try to do it with just your cursor it's very difficult to go left and right perfectly you're usually off by a little uh, a few pixels but anyways I won't go into too much detail because I know rulers aren't the most interesting thing in Photoshop but now that you guys know how to use ruler guides and you know how to work with them a little bit you can now pat yourself on the back congratulations so thank you guys for watching this video and in the next video um well it's gonna be awesome Alright guys, welcome to your 12th Photoshop tutorial and in this tutorial I'm going to be teaching you guys how to use the rectangular marquee tool. Pretty freaking sweet. Now we're going to be working with the image of the puppy that I got today actually. My new best friend in the whole world, old Dan. How freaking cute is he? Eight weeks old and actually I'm going to be talking a little bit uh, kind of quiet during this tutorial because old Dan is sleeping right behind me like three feet literally and I really don't want to wake him up because this is the first time he's been sleeping all day but anyways I'm gonna be a little quiet and
try to do this tutorial. So in order to get the rectangle marquee tool, we need to go ahead and use this tool. And once you see the options, you're going to see rectangular marquee tool. Now this is one of the tools that allows you to make a selection or select a portion of your image. Now why the heck would you want to select a portion of your image? Well let's say that um, we wanted to cut the bottom half of this image out. So instead of you know his feet it would say maybe we want to add some text in there. Or maybe we just want to cut out this rope and put in I don't know like a hot dog so it looks like he's eating a hot dog. I don't freaking know. The important thing is you can do many things but let's just focus on making that selection for this tutorial. So once you have your tool selected, in order to make a normal selection, just go ahead and drag with your cursor and once you release, you can see that the selection is made and it's going to have these little, I call them marching ants, around a little dotted line. Now like I said, with a selection what you can do is a bunch of different things. You can cut that, um, paste it another location, but uh, for now like I said we won't get into what you can do with the selection I only want to show you guys how to use this tool now you may be thinking okay that tool is easy enough to use however there are a bunch of sub options that you can or options sub options options tomato tomato that you can use with this tool the first one is this little doohickey right here this is add to selection now whenever you have this option chosen what you can do is you can make another selection and it adds that to the current selection. So as you can see we have a selection over old Dan's eye. If we want to get his nose in this as well, make a new selection and as you can see whenever I release that we now have one huge entire selection, his eye and his nose. And you can do this as many times as you want. If you want to get his other eye in there too, select that, check it out one freaking huge selection. Now of course since we have add this next one is subtract so maybe we want to say you know what I just want his eyes in there so let's go ahead and subtract the nose and it takes this portion out from the current selection. Now this last one is the only one that can get kind of confusing. What this intersect with selection does is it's going to allow you to make a new selection. Then what it's going to do is it's going to see where it overlaps this selection and creates a selection based on that. Weird? Let me go ahead and show you. So you see that we have two of his eyes in the little spot above his nose selected right now. Well I'm going to go ahead and make a new selection that selects all of this area. Now take a note that the only place that these two selections overlap is his eye, his right eye. So I'm going to go ahead and release and check it out. Wherever the two selections overlapped is where I'm going to get that current selection. That oh oh blah blah hey blah hey boom boom boom. Oh sorry. That's why it's called intersect selection tool. Basically, where they overlap. Now, a lot of people ask, you know what? How do I get rid of a selection if I say okay? Oh crap! I pressed the wrong thing. Let me just go ahead and get rid of that crap. How the heck do I get rid of it altogether? Well, in order to get rid of your entire selection, hold down control on your keyboard and press Z. This pretty much allows you to start from new. And you know what? Actually, I shouldn't have made all those selections. But, <laughs> but um, well, let me say this. Whenever you make a selection for the first time and you hit control Z, it's um gonna do undo, and that's the shortcut for undo. But the shortcut for um D selection, I guess it's called, is Control D. So let me go ahead and demonstrate that one more time. Control Z is undo, and that may do it if it's your first selection, but Control D is D selection. So I guess I probably should have said that first and foremost. But now, hey, you guys know the shortcut for undo as well. So the other two things that I wanted to talk to you guys about is fix ratio and fix size selection. So with this selection tool, Right now, we are in normal. That means we can make uh, rectangle selections, this shape, this shape, perfect square if we want. Now, aside from just making, you know, a free, total freedom over your selection, you can give it a certain rules to, fo to follow. So for style, if we put fixed ratio, of course, one to one, a one to one rectangle is a square. So if you do that, you can't make anything but a square. Go ahead and try. I dare you to. Now if you do fixed size, what it's going to do is it's going to allow you to input a certain pixel amount. Now 64, 64 is kind of a small 
uh, square. So what you can do is obviously since you have a fixed size, you don't need to drag because it already knows how big it's going to be. All you need to do is with this selected, hover over a portion of your image and click. Now obviously, as you can see, what it does is it makes that selection and it uses your cursor as the upper left hand side or left hand point of that rectangle. So one more time, just go ahead and click. And as you can see, it makes a selection on the image that's 64 by 64 and it uses your cursor as the upper left hand side. Now, that is basically how you make a selection using the rectangular marquee tool. I know. <coughs> Oh, what the heck just flew into my throat? That was disgusting. But uh, yeah, there's not much to it once you know all the different tools. Probably 90% of the time, you're just gonna go with normal and normal, or whatever this one's called. New selection, normal. That gives you the most freedom. And you guys are gonna learn some keyboard sh shortcuts in the upcoming tutorials. But for now, thank you guys for watching.